Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Brooke Schreier, and uh, as you can see, we're about to get started here. Um, I'm sure some other folks will be trickling in as we go. Uh, recording is in progress, so this will be posted on our YouTube after the fact. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Brooke Schreier. I am the Assistant Coordinator for the Invading Species Awareness Program out of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. I've been working with the Invading Species Awareness Program for about eight years now, and I've worked on a, a variety of projects over the years from everything from invasive carps that we'll be speaking about today to clean drain dry programming all around Lake Simcoe in southern Ontario. I also uh, spearhead reporting for the province, so invasive species reporting in, uh, insofar as the invading species hotline, which is 1-800-563-7711, as well as the early detection and distribution mapping system, otherwise known as EDMAPS, which is another tool for the public to report invasive species sightings. The last thing uh, that I wanted to mention is I also spearhead the Wild Pig Surveillance Program, which is a volunteer-led program that we're running out of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters with funding from Green Shovels to assist the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in looking for wild pigs so that we can get ahead of any potential established population in Ontario. So with me today, I have Dr. Premick Hammer, who I'm excited to introduce. Now, Dr. Premick Hammer is a retired teacher from Upper Canada College, where he taught environmental systems and biology for 20 years. He is presently working as a freelance biologist. His research centers on the distribution and life history of aquatic and terrestrial crayfishes, uh, as well as the expansion of exotic crayfishes in Canada. He is pre presently assisting the Ministry of Natural Resources, as well as us, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as our crayfish expert, as you can probably tell by the poster on the back of his wall and all the specimens that he has there too. He attained his bachelor's degree in environmental science at Con Concordia University of Montreal and his master's degree in freshwater ecosystems from Trent University in Peterborough, where I also went. From 1984 to 1993, he resided in Hobart, Tasmania, where he obtained his doctorate from the zoology department at the University of Tasmania. As part of his PhD thesis, he studied the life history of the giant Tasmanian crayfish, a spectacular species, which is, I believe, the largest freshwater crayfish in the world and reaches, up, uh, reaches weights of up to four kilograms. He has also worked for the Inland Fisheries Commission in Australia, the Canadian Wildlife Service in Canada, and before jo joining UCC Upper Canada College, he lectured in biology at Trent University. So Premick, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. And then uh, we have Robert McGowan, who has been working in the environmental sector for over 18 years and has a plethora of knowledge and experience that he has gained having been employed with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Trent University, Fleming College, and now with us, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. As our aquatic project specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, he's been the lead for water soldier monitoring in the province. He leads our mystery snail removal and management program, which has been running for the last few years and is responsible for removing upwards of 600,000 mystery snails and spearheads programming for high profile species, such as invasive carps, which we'll hear more about shortly. So just some housekeeping before we get uh, into the thick of things. So we have scheduled about 45 minutes for the talks. So I'll be speaking for about 10, 15 minutes, at which point I will be passing it off to Premick to deliver his presentation. And then we'll close out with Rob. We are hoping to wrap up. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we want to wrap up around 8 p.m., but it may go a little bit longer. So hopefully folks can stick around to, uh, you know, maybe ask some questions. You'll see that obviously you, you are unable to uh, unmute. So we would, you know, really like you guys just to plug your questions into the Q&A. And when I'm finished presenting, I'll be compiling the questions. I'll try to answer some via, you know, typing, but then I'll probably save some for the end so we can do a bit of a live Q&A. So without uh, further ado, let's jump in. So I'll be briefly uh, describing to you who we are as the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the Being Species Awareness Program. We'll jump into some terminology so that we're all in the same kind of, you know, playing field before we, we delve into some of the, uh, the species. And then I'll be going through the Asian Carps 101, um, fully recognizing that there are tons of different fish species that are, uh, you know, a risk to the province. But I have chosen to kind of focus my presentation on these high profile species, which are the four Asian Carps or invasive Carps. Then we will hear from Premick on the impacts of invasive crayfishes in the Canadian Great Lakes, and we'll close it out with invasive aquatic plants and macroalgae that Rob will be presenting. So the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters has been around uh, quite a long time. We celebrated our 95th birthday today, actually, and we are the largest nonprofit charitable fish and wildlife conservation organization 
in Ontario. We have 100,000 members, subscribers, and supporters, including 725 membership clubs. And we really represent the voice of anglers and hunters in the province and all things related to uh, fish and wildlife resources, uh, as well as trapping. And then within the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, you have the Invading Species Awareness Program, which was founded in 1992 as a partnership program between the OFAH and the Ontario government. So ever since 1992, we've been trying to raise the profiles for various aquatic invasive species and terrestrial invasive species, and we've done that through a variety of ways, but we really focus on education and awareness and generating that education and awareness. We also facilitate monitoring and early detection, and we also support surveillance control and response in the province. So who do we target with our outreach? You know, we target anybody who's really on the landscape. If you're somebody who likes to hike or likes to boat, is a, hort a horticulturalist or, you know, an angler, a hunter, all of these individuals who are on the landscape could potentially represent, uh, you know, a pathway of spread for various aquatic or terrestrial invasive species. So we try to engage with all sorts of different demographics of individuals across the province who may be responsible for spreading some of these nasty invaders that we find ourselves housing here in Ontario. So in terms of terminology, this is a real, you know, uh, kind of high level definition for these various uh, types of species that we're talking about. And whether you call them alien or introduced or non-native, uh, to me, it's all relatively synonymous. So when we're talking about a non-native species, we're talking about something like the Chinook salmon, which didn't originate here, but was introduced either intentionally or unintentionally uh, at a time. So... Now, when we contrast that with aquatic invasive species, you see something like the round goby, which is a species that was, you know, uh, inadvertently introduced to the Great Lakes in the early 90s and is having detrimental impacts on the environment, society, uh, as well as the economy, and sometimes even human health, depending on the species. And then obviously you have terrestrial invasive species, which I think all of you can assume, uh, you know what that is, but those are the species that find themselves on land, such as Japanese knotweed, and are also having those same detrimental impacts on the environment, the economy, or society. So here's a kind of a landscape perspective of Ontario today. Um, we have about 440 to 445 invasive plants in southern Ontario. We have, I think the number's up to 185 non-native or invasive species in the Great Lakes, so aquatic species. We have 39 known invasive forest insects, such as the emerald uh, ash borer and so many others. Um, the Asian longhorn beetle, which is pictured there, is actually not established in the province. And at one point it was uh, detected at Pearson Airport, but it was subsequently eradicated. And then we also have 10 invasive tree diseases today. So, it, you know, it goes without saying that Ontario is the most heavily invaded province in all of Canada. And there's a variety of reasons for that, that we can almost dedicate an entire webinar to. Uh, so I won't really get into that. But as you can see, there, there are huge economic impacts for these, these species in Ontario. So it really is up to our due diligence as organizations that work in this field, as well as just regular members of the public, that we do our part to try to prevent the spread of these aquatic and terrestrial invasive species. So let's jump in to the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So today I'm talking about the four species of invasive carps um that you know are currently established down in the united states and if you didn't know there are actually four species of uh invasive carps and in order from top to bottom you see the grass carp then you see the big head carp you see the silver carp and then you see the black carp and these you know are fish species that were introduced in the 1960s and 1970s into aquaculture ponds down the u.s and then subsequently escaped their enclosures sometime, you know, in, in those years, the 60s or 70s, into the Mississippi River. And what they started doing was reproducing, migrating, and spreading north until today, which now they currently find themselves sort of butting up against the electrical barriers, which are in the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal. And those electrical barriers are a big part of what is deterring these species from getting into the Great Lakes. That being said, the one thing I want to make very clear is that there are no established populations of invasive carps in Ontario's waters today. And though we have seen some sightings, and I will go into that shortly, um, there are still no established populations. Now, one thing I do want to clarify is that these are not to be confused with the common carp, so Cyprinus carpio, which you see on the left-hand side there at the bottom, um, which is a non-native species, and well, to some people it's non-native, to some people it's invasive, and it definitely does have invasive tendencies depending on where it is introduced. 
but it is not a species that we necessarily want reported to our program via the invading species hotline or EDMAPS because, you know, it's been here since the 1800s, it's well spread, and, you know, it was actually in intentionally introduced in many uh, places as a, as a food fish. So let's look at the silver carps. They're usually sometimes collectively referred to as the silver carps because they both appear quite similar. Um, so on the top there, you have the big head, you have the silver on the bottom, and you can kind of get the, the relative size of these species when you look at, you know, that full-grown adult human in contrast to a full-grown, uh, you know, big head and, and silver carp. These are very big fish. They're, they're big fish that are growing quickly. We typically say that within the first year of growth, they can actually outgrow the mouth size or the gape size of our native predatory fish. So what that means is our native fish species, which you would assume would want to predate on these invasive carps, can't actually do that after the first year of growth because they're just simply too big at that point. So once they get to that one year mark, you're basically left with, you know, potentially larger, you know, predators um, outside of the water or even humans to try to manage the, the, the species. And at that point, it's quite unsuccessful. In terms of their origin, they are from Asia. They are from, you know, places in, in China as well as parts of Russia. And they feed on a, a kind of a variety of things uh, when you talk about all four species. But these species in particular focus on zooplankton and phytoplankton. And they, they both do exhibit that, that schooling behavior. And if you guys have seen any videos of the silver carp, it is the species, the one on the bottom there, that would typically leap out of the water in schools when they're disturbed. So whether it's by a boat motor or paddlers or, or you know, really anything, they'll start leaping out of the water, which is, you know, all well and dandy when, you're, when you see it from afar. But when you're in it, you know, it's, it's less than exciting. And they can leap up to three meters, which is, you know, eight to nine feet. And, you know, they, they damage boats, then they can also damage your, your person as well. They also live a very long time, and each female can lay up to about a million eggs when they go through a reproductive cycle. So no, no amount of management from a human perspective is going to reduce, you know, a population of these guys if they are allowed to establish and start reproducing at, at a, you know, a huge rate. It's just exponential growth. So here's the current distribution, you know, um, as I said, there's no established populations in Ontario, and we are still happy to report that, that is still the case today. Um, I know that there were some fears with COVID uh, that people were worried that, you know, the, the powers that be, the, the federal government in Canada, as well as the state governments in the U.S. may become a little bit more relaxed due to COVID restrictions um, and wouldn't be able to get out on the water to, to monitor for these fish species. But still today, you know, having received a, a, an update from DFO just recently, um, they're, they're, you know, they haven't seen any grass carp in a few years or other, other invasive carps in our waters in Canada. So we're still hopeful. And honestly, in terms of invasive species, that's good news, right? Because historically, what happened was species got in, and then they became established, and then they began to spread. And then that's when we all realized, oh, hang on, we have to do something about this. We have to spread education awareness. We have to prevent their spread. You know, and a perfect example of that is zebra mussels back in the early or late 80s, early 90s. But now, you know, with these types of species, what we're doing is looking on the horizon, seeing them on the horizon, and then saying, no, we don't want those here in the province. We need to do something now to prevent them from getting here. So as you can see, you know, I mentioned the, the uh, Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal. So there's Chicago there. And then you have the Illinois River that runs down into the Mississippi. And you can see that this, this, these two species are well established and distributed throughout those systems in the, in the Illinois and the Mississippi River sheds. Then you have the black carp. This is, you know, the, the longest and largest of the fish. It can get fairly huge, up to about six feet. And it does, you know, it, it has the same or, uh, origin as the other uh, invasive, spe or invasive carps. And this one's unique, though, in that it, you know, primarily feeds on zooplankton when it's uh, young. But then as it grows, it actually starts to feed on mollusks. Um, and it actually has these really neat looking, you know, pharyngeal teeth in the back of its jaw, which uh, almost look like human molars that they use to crush various species. And because I know somebody may ask it, you know, these things are inefficient when it comes to feeding on things like zebra mussels. And there has been uh, some literature that has been written on, you know, a case study of these things trying to feed on uh, invasive zebra mussels. And they're just inefficient. You know, it'd take them about an hour to eat a pound of them, which, you know, when you know how many zebra mussels are in the water, these things are not going to put a dent in a zebra mussel population. But what they would do if introduced is they would have severe impacts on our already threatened mussel populations or native clam populations, I should say. 
as you can see, their distribution is much more to the south than the other species. And, uh, you know, when I was down there in 2018, the Illinois River, we were fishing for all four species. And that day we caught, you know, six silver carp and one grass carp. And they told me that they, they very infrequently actually run into a black carp. So it seems to be the one of the four species that is, you know, the least amount of concern, at least currently. And then getting into the, the big baddie right now, this is the most imminent threat to Ontario's waters. This is the grass carp. And we have, uh, we collectively, uh, Asian Carps Canada, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resource and Forestry, uh, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, you know, as well as many others have found or, or captured 39 grass carp in Canadian waters since 2014. Um, though I did just mention a few minutes ago that we haven't found any um, in the last few years, which, you know, Fingers crossed that continues to be the case. So we're still in a good position. You know, we don't have any re reproducing grass carp in our waters, but people aren't, you know, naive to the fact that there are no barriers between the U.S. waters and the Canadian waters. And larval grass carp eggs have been found in the Maumee and Sandusky River sheds, which are in the state of Ohio. And I know having a, a seat on the Great Lakes panel that the Great Lakes panel and the state of Ohio are all working very hard trying to eradicate, trying to monitor for those fish. They use what are called Judas fish, where they'll, they'll actually attach a tracker to a grass carp that they capture before putting it back in the water. Because again, schooling behavior, they'll be able to find more grass carp to get them out of the water. So fingers crossed, you know, between the Department of Fisheries and Oceans fre frequently offering to go down to help and having done so many times in the past, as well as the states also lending hands to Ohio that we do not end up with an established population of this species. Because this species in particular, you could probably guess, but its diet is actually, uh, you know, grasses and, and weeds. It's herbivorous. So it feeds on aquatic plants. It can consume about 40% of its weight every single day in aquatic plants, but much of that goes undigested. So then a lot of that high nutrient, you know, waste is coming out of that fish. And if you have a large enough population of grass carp, it can actually add to something like algal blooms. So here are here is the current distribution of grass carp. You know you can see uh, the many red points in Ontario's waters, and the largest capture uh, was actually in Lake Gibson, which is just off the Welland Canal, and that was in 2016 when an angler actually ended up catching one. And you'll see some of the photos from that a little bit later towards the end of the presentation, where um, he reported it. We got you know we notified our partners, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And two days later, they were out on the water electrofishing and actually removed 10 grass carp from that water body. So, you know, we're, we're being diligent in Ontario, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they monitor all the, the major tributaries where these fish could be going to spawn in the spring and uh, throughout the summer. And, and they're looking for these fish so that when they are captured, they're removed from our waters without being given a chance to reproduce. One really important thing that I wanted to do for you know the anglers that are on the line uh, or even just the recreationalists that are on the water, if you ever see a, a fish that you suspect is a grass carp, you know here's some of the key things to look for. So that top left image there, you're seeing a, a narrow or short dorsal fin, which is not to be confused with the, that long dorsal fin of the common carp, right? That is one of the key identifying features because when you're on the water, you're gonna see the dorsal fin. So that's what you wanna look for. You wanna look for that, that narrow or long dorsal fin. If it's long and it's a big fish, you're probably seeing a common carp or maybe something like a, a you know, buffalo species, just something else. You're not seeing a grass carp or you're not seeing any of the other invasive carps because they all have that narrow dorsal fin. Another key thing is if you do happen to pull it out of the water, look for that eye placement. As you can see in the bottom left there, that eye is actually in line with the mouth opening, which is quite uncharacteristic of a lot of species in Ontario. As you can see here in this image, the, the common carp's eyes are much more uh, elevated on the head. Same with species like you know sucker species or a white sucker. So that's another thing, eye placement, you know, body size, the dorsal, the dorsal fin, and then, you know, those are the, the really the types of things that you want to look for uh, in order to differentiate this species from others. And if you want to download this fact sheet, you can actually go to invadingspecies.com where we have a plethora of uh, resources that you can download, print, uh, or you can even get in touch with us and we'd be happy to ship you some resources. Now, as I said, you know, there's not only so much time to speak, and I know I want to get moving on here to, to Prima Camera, give him the time to talk about crayfishes, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are a lot of aquatic, you know, or I shouldn't say aquatic, there are a lot of fishes, I think it's assumed that they're aquatic, uh, that are threatening the province, that are either in our waters or that are a threat of becoming in our waters. 
you know, goldfish, that's an invasive fish species that should never be released. You know, rudd is an invasive fish species that is, you know, around the Welland Canal, uh, Hamilton area. We have tench, which is, it came out from the Richelieu River in Quebec when it was introduced into a fish farm, and now it's in the St. Lawrence. Northern snakehead, we're still very fortunate that we don't have that in our waters, and it, it still gets frequently reported in the province because there are two native lookalikes in the Bowfin and Burbit. And then you have Eurasian Rough, which is was, was actually a ballast water introduction uh, up in Thunder Bay region, and it's currently residing there. And then you have the Round Gobi, which many of you in Southern Ontario would know is just a nasty you know, invasive fish species that was introduced via ballast water. And now when you do catch these things, make sure you kill round gobies. You know, they're not to be re-released into the water. So with that, you know, I, I know it's it's tough because I have to fly through it, but uh, I'm going to pass it on to Premic here. If there's any questions related to invasive carps uh, or any of these invasive fishes, I'd be more than happy to answer them at the end. And with that, Premic, I will pass control over to you. And you are good to go. Okay. So yeah, thanks, uh, Brooke. That was very uh, instructional for for those of us who study uh, uh, invertebrates. And so I'm I'm going to talk to you uh, today about uh, invasive uh, crayfish. Um, we have we have a few in the province, and we have a few that are uh, suspected to be here, and and a few that are probably on uh, on their way very soon. So. Um, Let's see, click. I don't seem to be able to advance. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is one of our big invaders. That's why I wipe, wiped out the native uh, pictures. This is the rusty crayfish. Some of you may know about it already. Uh, but in Ontario, we have essentially 11 uh, species of crayfish. Many people don't actually realize that we have that many uh, different crayfish in the province. And they're basically divided into river dwelling and lake dwelling, stream dwelling crayfish and burrowing crayfish. So out of the 11 uh, species, eight are native, three are introduced already. And uh, out, of, out of the native ones, uh, as I said, three of them are, are the burrowers. They built chimneys and maybe you will have seen them. But uh, unfortunately today, I'm not gonna talk about uh, uh, and native crayfish. I'm gonna be uh, talking about the, the introduced ones. So the ones in the, in the, in the red. Oops, having a little bit of trouble here. There we go. So first thing um, I wanted to touch on is uh, there are regulations uh, uh, dealing with crayfish. So you, you, there's a possession limit. You're only allowed to possess 36 at a time. They can be used as bait when you're angling, but they, they can only be used in the same water bo body that you've caught them. So basically you're not allowed to bring crayfish from a different water body to, to go fishing to, to a particular lake. Uh, they cannot be uh, transported overland, dead or alive. So you cannot move crayfish under any circumstances. And this pertains to both the introduced species as well as, uh, as, well as our native species. So uh, the, the only three uh, species that are actually um, essentially prohibited in Ontario are, are uh, the marbled crayfish, which I'm going to talk about later, the red swamp crayfish, and the common yabby, which is from Australia. They're all prohibited, and in fact, none of them have been uh, caught yet in Ontario in the wild. Um, but I, I will get back to that, because the, the marbled crayfish may actually be, be here already. Um, and uh, just... Uh, the, the only other thing is uh, just to mention is that the, the rusty crayfish, which is uh, really widespread in Ontario, introduced, uh, is banned in Manitoba. You're not allowed to be in possession of it under any circumstances. So because they're really worried about uh, the invasion front moving into Manitoba. Um, so I'm going to go through the introduced species. So the, there's, the, as I said, there's the three species that are listed uh, officially. And then the first one is the, the obscure crayfish. Uh, and this crayfish is, is fairly rare. It, it, it was probably introduced by anglers from uh, Ohio because it's native to, to Ohio. 
but it is it's mostly found in uh, around the Algonquin Park region. So that's where I've seen it mostly. Uh, it does get confused with one of our natives. So often it's reported as as being somewhere, but but those a lot of those reports are, are not. Um, not substantiated and and we're not sure whether they're real or whether that was it was confusion with with the northern clearwater crayfish the difference between those two crayfish is if you look at the rostrum they they the the so so kind of the nose of the crayfish uh, that sticks out between the eyes the the native one has a ridge down the middle of it and this one doesn't but otherwise they're very similar and easily easily confused Now the the big one the uh, that some of you hopefully know about this is the is the rusty crayfish, which has been uh, introduced to Ontario since we think the 1960s, probably into Rice Lake in the Kawarthas, because that's that's where it seems to have spread from. Um, and uh, now it's it's entered into Manitoba, as I mentioned, and also uh, into Quebec. So it's it's moving into moving east and moving west from from Ontario. Um, it, it, for us, it, it is actually quite a big problem. So when you look at the distribution here, uh, you could see that it's the, the these the circles show you how many how how many. Um, uh, how many uh, different places that it was found. So it's basically all, uh, in, a, in Ontario, uh, everywhere from, from Thunder Bay all the way to, to uh, Ottawa um, and, and then uh, to the Grand River uh, in the Kitchener region. Uh, but if, if, if for some reason it is not in, has not been reported and we have not found it in southwestern Ontario, which is kind of strange because it does come from from Ohio. So, uh, but it does not seem to like the those the the rivers in in southwest Ontario. They're very green, very warm, so it may have something to do with that. But we have looked there and just have not found it. Uh, it's a big problem because it's it's replaced uh, uh, basically where it where it is found it's replaced all of our river and lake dwelling crayfish the natives uh, and it also hybridizes with them so in the Kawarthas, for example where I'm I'm at right now we we're basically down to one species the rusty crayfish it's very very difficult to find a, a native. Uh, in most of the parts of the Kawarthas. you have to look really hard go into the. Um, headwaters of some of the streams. The way you can identify this crayfish is it's pretty easy. Uh, it's got these obvious red spots where you would pick up the crayfish on the carapace at the rear of the carapace. You can see it in this picture. Uh, it's got these obvious red spots. I mean, the other thing is the rostrum is also uh, like pinched. So when you look between the eyes, it's it looks like it, it, the rostrum was pinched, and then uh, the the male crayfish have these these uh, sperm transfer organs uh, underneath them called gonopods, and they're also characteristic uh, shapes. So, so you could tell different species from each other by looking at the at their reproductive organs. Uh, then, uh, so uh, the the other problem with this uh, with the species is that uh, it hybridizes with with one, especially one of our natives, the the northern clearwater crayfish, which is uh, Faxonius propinquus. And so you get these populations where they're mixed; uh, they have mixed characteristics, and they're very difficult to to identify to figure out whether they're rusticus, whether they're the rusty crayfish, or the northern clear water crayfish because they'll have a suit of different characters that vary they'll sometimes they'll look more like the native and sometimes they'll look more uh, like the rusty crayfish but in the end these hybrids when they keep interbreeding uh, will turn into rusty crayfish and and the population will be, become completely uh, rusty uh, then the next uh, the big next big problem uh, which actually uh, has been detected in Ontario is this uh, uh, marbled crayfish, or uh, which which is an asexual crayfish. So it's parthenogenic, which means that the there's only females. 
So the, the, the females lay eggs, these eggs hatch, uh, and a female will, let's say, have 100 eggs, and then from those 100 eggs, you'll get 100 females, and they'll, uh, they'll all lay another 100 eggs. So pretty quickly, you can, uh, you can get uh, <laughs> a plague of these marbled crayfish. And they are a big problem in Europe. They've escaped there. They, they, they think that they came uh, uh, from, from culture, from, from uh, pet stores in, in Germany, that they, they, uh, there was a mutation. Uh, and these crayfish are triploid, so they have three sets of genes. So they're very interesting to scientists uh, who study them. But, uh, but they are a nuisance, and they've, they've taken over several European countries, and they're surviving very well. They've also been introduced uh, into Japan and Madagascar. And, and they survive well in winter uh, underneath, underneath the ice. Uh, and uh, so they're likely to survive uh, in Canada, uh, in Ontario, especially in Southern Ontario or British Columbia, or even the Maritimes. Um, uh, it's, and, and these crayfish are bad because they outcompete uh, uh, the natives where they've been introduced. And so, so they're an issue. They have been banned in, in Ontario uh, as of December 2021. But if you go on Kijiji, they're still available uh, uh, for sale. So people are still selling them online because aquaculturists and, and aquarium uh, enthusiasts will have one crayfish and then pretty soon it, it will turn into hundreds of crayfish and they don't know what to do with them. So, so often they're trying to sell them. So that's a big issue. And we actually found in these crayfish, so it was the first uh, record uh, wild that was reported in, in Ontario and in, in Burlington and the stormwater ponds. And uh, they were reported by, uh, by uh, hikers that, that saw them walking on, on, a, on a path. And this is a photograph of, of one of the uh, crayfish walking on, on the on the footpath, and also the, the the staff at that park. It's a it's there's a there's a park associated uh, uh, there, uh, like uh, football soccer fields. Uh, the, the the groundskeepers actually took pictures of some of these crayfish walking on the turf on the soccer fields. Now we went, so uh, I went with Brooke and, and, uh, and we, we, looked, uh, we looked for these crayfish. We could not find any, uh, any live specimens, uh, uh, even though we looked as much, uh, you know, and tried trapping and, and, and netting and stuff. But uh, we used also uh, environmental DNA. So th this, this uh, means you look, uh, you sample the water and you, look, uh, and you could tell by looking at what DNA is in the water, you could tell what species are, are present in that water. And we got positive uh, hits um uh, during, uh, in in August uh, 2022 and actually in October as well so they look like they're in there but but we can't uh we can't find them so what 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 uh what they've done this winter though is they dewatered these ponds and we're hoping that that these crayfish were frozen out and that uh, they uh you know that they're no longer there but We'll have to check uh, next spring, uh, this spring and summer, and see if, if we still get the hits of eDNA or if we can find some specimens. Now, the, the other, uh, other big concern, I think, as far as uh, 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 crayfish that are recently introduced uh, is, is this white river crayfish which is, is now uh, seems to be established in, in Ontario, certainly on Pelee Island. We, it, it has been reported um, by naturalists for a while and we've just only figured out because people don't know which crayfish are native and which are not uh, generally. And so it, it's only been lately that we figured out, uh, figured out that there are these uh, reproducing populations throughout uh, Pelee Island. And our, unfortunately, we also had a, a couple of reports from uh, Six Mile Lake Provincial Park and uh, Port Severn. Um, on Georgian Bay. So they look like they've been brought in, uh, uh, probably uh, again uh, through angling. And this is just a map of, of, the, of, of the 
distribution. So the light brown is, is the natural distribution of the species. And then the circles are all uh, introductions in, in the United States. And the two red dots are the two disjunct uh, uh, places that we found them. So one's Pelee Island, and then you could see the other one is the, the, the Georgian Bay, Southern Georgian Bay region. So again, we're going to have to be looking looking for these, and we're hoping that people will also be on the lookout and and report them, uh, 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 report sightings of them, and then we can figure out where they are. But be that as it may, in in uh, in uh, Pelee Island, uh, this, these are photographs of uh, of the crayfish from Pelee Island. They're quite large. They could be either red or or pale kind of green beige. Uh, they have a very, they, they're quite different from our crayfish. They have these long claws and, uh, and, and very tuberculated, so bumpy carapaces. So they look quite different from our crayfish. The, the long claws with the bumps are, are, are characteristic. And there's also a black stripe going down, down the tail segments. So that's some ways you can identify them. Uh, now we're we're quite worried about them on Pelee Island because Pelee Island has two of our native burrowing species uh, there, and we don't know what the impact is going to be of these of these large crayfish uh, in in those areas. Pelee Island has a lot of wetlands; it doesn't really have any lakes or or streams, but it does have canals and wetlands, and and these crayfish are are burrowing; uh, they can burrow. So they're a worry for me because. I, I figure they can compete with our burrowing species and they can also compete with our uh, lake and stream crayfish uh, because they seem to be doing fine in, in, in Georgian Bay and, and fine in the, in the wetlands on, on Pelee Island. Um, and, and then so moving on now the, to, to species that may be in the province but may not be this this crayfish uh, has been uh, spreading in in New Brunswick and in uh, and in uh, Quebec it's called the spiny cheek crayfish because it's got these spines on the, on the sides of, 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 of the head so you can identify that's one of the identifying the main identifying feature of it and it's also got these uh, rusty spots kind of on the on the tail segments um, this crayfish is a big issue in Europe it's been introduced there uh, since the actually 1800s and it brought uh, a disease disease uh, the crayfish plague to Europe and spread it uh, and and as a result all of the European crayfish are now basically endangered and and very rare um, uh, all over Europe uh, from from the e from east to west basically so this crayfish has been reported on an island in the Ottawa River just uh, on the other side of, of the border from Ontario and and it's also been reported in Montreal so it is in the St Lawrence River and it is in the Ottawa River in the Ottawa River it's it's very close to Ontario so it's just a probably a matter of time before it crosses the border the the, the issue is whether it's going to be able to compete with the large populations of rusty crayfish that are on the eastern eastern border of of Ontario uh, and uh, they may uh, outcompete these crayfish and basically not allow them to to enter our province. So it will be an introduced species against an introduced species. Um, and one of the last species is the the, the famous uh, Louisiana red crayfish. Uh, it's it's uh, it's the crayfish that if you if you ever buy crayfish to eat in Canada, you're probably gonna uh, get the Louisiana red crayfish. They're available for sale frozen, but they have been intercepted uh, live uh, in Toronto and Guelph. They're very popular in China. They have huge festivals there. That are devoted to to, to these to eating crayfish and uh, and they ha they have been introduced all over the world, including China and Africa now, and uh, they have spread spread like wildfire. This this uh, uh, picture shows you all the different places they've been introduced all over the world. 
um, and uh, and what 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 year that occurred. So they're they're in the Nile River. They're actually harvested in the Nile River. I, I just bought some frozen ones from Costco the other day. Uh, so they're being harvested and 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 sold all over the world uh, from from the Nile and from China as well. They have been reported in Canada, not in Ontario, but they're in a pond near the airport uh, in Richmond, uh, BC. And they have just uh, very recently been uh, uh, reported from one uh, lake in, in Nova Scotia in September, 2022. So they are in Canada, but the, as far as we know, they're not in Ontario yet, although they are on, on the Southern shores of, of Lake Erie in Ohio. So they may, may be able to cross or may be introduced from there. Uh, they, they're uh, uh, very similar to the white river crayfish that I showed you before. Uh, uh, the, the one big difference is, is, is just uh, is, is on the back of the carapace, there's a thing called the areola where the, where the two things meet. I don't know if you could see my pointer or, or not, but uh, in, in the red crayfish it's joined and in the, in the white river crayfish it's, it's um, separated. They also have different uh, different male gonopods, but they are for a, for a person who doesn't know crayfish very well. They're very difficult to separate those two species. They come in all sorts of colors. So even though they're called Louisiana red crayfish, they can come in orange, white, uh, mottled, uh, you know, all sorts of colors. So co the color is not really a good uh, characteristics. So uh, finally, hopefully, I'm not running over too much. But uh, what I did uh, this fall is I actually wrote a, a, um, a big report for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forests uh, on, uh, on the invasion risk and, and potential impact of various crayfish. And I rated them and you could see uh, here, this, this is the, ya the Yabi is the first one. So that's an Australian species. I rated that low because they're susceptible to, to a disease that our crayfish carry, but are immune. And so they're not likely uh, to, to survive in North America very well because they'll get infected with the crayfish plague and probably uh, die. The second one is the signal crayfish, which I didn't show you any pictures. It's actually a native to, to the West Coast uh, so it's it's in it's found in BC. It's a huge problem in Europe. It's it's spread. The, it was introduced there to replace the dying uh, uh, European crayfish, and and it's spread like wildfire there, um, and it survives very well. But luckily, it has never uh, been moved from the west coast to the to, to the eastern part of Canada, and hopefully that will not happen. But uh, if it was moved, it would probably uh, do really well in Ontario. So I I rated it high. Um, and then there's a, a couple of related, the, the three related crayfish, the Procambaris, which one of them is the red, uh, the white river crayfish, the red swamp crayfish and the Everglades crayfish. They're very similar, all, to, all three of them. I rated the red swamp crayfish and the white river crayfish uh, high because what, uh, the white river crayfish is already present in Ontario. The red swamp crayfish is likely uh, to come uh, come over through through Lake Erie and the Everglades, I rated low because uh, because it's a, a tropical species and and it doesn't occur anywhere near our borders and may not survive well uh, because it's a subtropical uh, species that occurs mostly in the south of the United States. Uh, the marbled crayfish, I also rated high, which, as I said, it's we think that it, it may be present uh, uh, or was present in Burlington. Hopefully we got rid of them, uh, but they are since they are still being sold, there's no way of telling whether whether they've escaped somewhere else. And until we get another report, we, we don't really know what the status of that is, but the, they survive in Europe well. Uh, they go through European winters, you know, which are the water doesn't get any colder in Europe than it does here. It's four degrees at its, you know, at its coldest uh, and uh, at, at depth and they can survive at those temperatures. So they should be able to uh, survive here. And uh, there's a, the Mexican crayfish, the dwarf crayfishes, 
uh, they, they're sold in pet stores. I rated those low because again, they're not likely to survive our, our winters. The spiny cheek crayfish are the ones that are coming over from Quebec. They're in the Ottawa River. So again, I rate it that high, even though we're not sure how they're gonna do when when they start um, coming to contact with the, with the rusty crayfish, which have been introduced here and have been here for a long time. The rusty crayfish are a big problem already. They've replaced natives uh, in many places, the, the Rouge, Rouge River is full of them. The Kawarthas are all full of them. They're all through Eastern Ontario. Uh, they're up in Thunder Bay. Um, and, and so they're there everywhere and they're still spreading. They're on Manitoulin Island and all sorts of places. Um, and then, so they're obviously high and present. And then finally the, the obscure crayfish or Allegheny crayfish uh, I rated low because it's it's even though it's been introduced to Ontario, it uh, it doesn't seem to be spreading. Uh, um, and uh, again, uh, in the United States, it doesn't do very well when it's when it's uh, with the rusty crayfish. So the rusty crayfish may be keeping their numbers down as well. So I think that's all I, I have for you. Hopefully uh, uh, you learned something about crayfish and um, I'll be able to answer some questions at the end, hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Premak. I appreciate uh, your chat. It was very thorough. And I also look forward to getting out uh, in the water with you looking for crayfish come April. Uh, but now we'll push it over to Rob McGowan. Um, so Rob, you have control, you can go ahead. Thanks, Premak. Thanks, Brooke. Hi everybody, my name is Rob McGowan. I'm the Aquatic Project Specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program. Um, today I'll be talking to you about uh, two uh, high priority species in Ontario, uh, you, you, uh, European Water Chestnut and Water Soldier. Um, both are on the Invasive Species Act as a prohibited species. They both have management, uh, active management plans right now uh, in, in Ontario. And the last species we'll be touching base on is uh, Starry Stonewort, which is a uh, macroalgae. So my slides aren't advancing. Oh, they are now. Okay, so European wild chestnut is a competitive invasive aquatic plant in shallow areas and has been introduced into sections of the Ottawa River, Rideau Canal, and the Cartagraque uh, River. Um, the introduction to these waterways could possibly be the result of a water garden plants being improperly released or a boat contaminated with water chestnut being launched within uh, those areas. Uh, European water chestnut is an annual floating leaved aquatic plant native to Asia and Africa. It was introduced in the late 1800s as an ornamental species because of its unique look and growth habit. After a series of accidental and in in intentional releases, uh, water chestnut slowly worked its way through the Northeast United States, most notably through the Hudson River watershed in New York and has spread across 12 states since then. Its distribution in Ontario consists of small isolated population in comparison to the US. Uh, it was first discovered in the Ottawa River in 2006 in uh, Voyager Provincial Park, and that population is managed by uh, the Ontario Parks. And then more, more recently, water chestnut was discovered in the Kingston and Frontenac Island areas in 2011 and the Rideau River, uh, just upstream of Black Rapids Dam. These two locations are uh, the main focus of the European Water Chestnut Program that Ducks Unlimited Canada oversees. So uh, European Water Chestnut has an appearance unlike any other plant species in Ontario. Uh, the features that can be used to identify the water chestnut include its floating leaves, as you can see here. Uh, the leaves are green with a sharply toothed edges. Uh, the leaves form a densely crowded rosette up to 30 centimeters in diameter. And the leaf stems are up to 15 centimeters long with a spongy swollen section that helps the plant float and stay uh, on the surface of the water. Underwater leaves are feather-like with finely dissected leaf segments. The flowers are small, white, and have four petals. And this, uh, you, the water chestnut produces um, <clears throat> this hard woody nut that's about three to four centimeters wide with sharp barbed spines. Um, this nut bears no resemblance to the water chestnut in culinary cooking. Um, and European water chestnut grows in quiet streams, ponds, freshwater regions of estuaries and on exposed mud flats. So uh, 
you can see the distribution here up in the Ottawa area, uh, down here between um, Belleville and Gananoque. So that's where the Ducks Unlimited is managing it. There was a small isolated population pop up near Oshawa, which um, one of the conservation authorities was actively managing that. But this population here uh, down in the Welland Canal was first discovered by a paddler uh, in 2021. Uh, and it was reported via uh, our online reporting tool lead maps. Um, the Invasive Species Center and Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority uh, implemented eradication program in 2022 with the key partners being the Ontario Federation of Angus Hunters, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, local paddle associations, and field natu naturalists. And last, in 2022, there's about 7,000 plants removed. Um, they're planning on bringing the pro program back in the summer of 2023 uh, with uh, four hit squad students from the Invading Species Awareness Program. Uh, we'll be out on the water uh, monitoring and removing plants. So water soldier is the next species. Um, water soldier is an, equative, uh, is an invasive aquatic perennial plant that is native to Europe and Northwest Asia. The first known wild population in North America was found in the Trent River in 2008. Uh, water soldier was used as an ornamental plant in water gardens, which is the likely source of the introduction to the Trent River, just like the European water chestnut was uh, introduced into the Ottawa River su suspectedly. So why is water soldier a problem? So water soldier forms dense mats of floating and submerged vegetation. It crowds out native vegetation, resulting in decreased biodiversity. It uh, forms dense floating mats of water soldier that can hinder recreational activities such as boating, angling, and swimming. And the sharp serrated leaf edges can cut swimmers and individuals will handle them. So you can see in this middle picture here, that's the margin of spines that, that are very sharp and can, can cut you. So you should be, uh, take caution whenever handling the plant. So how would you identify water soldier? So the rosettes can grow up to about uh, 60 centimeters. You can see me here in this picture with holding some uh, water soldier plants upside down that were much larger than 60 centimeters. Um, those were very mature plants, uh, probably been present in the waterway for four or five years. Um, it's very bright green in color, uh, especially in the water. Um, it almost, it, it seems like it's glowing. Um, not, not many of our native species have that same kind of uh, uh, bright green color. Um, the leaves are sword shaped, rigid, brittle, and have a serrated margin of those spines I was talking about earlier. The flowers are white with three petals. And water soldier uh, doesn't, uh, it, it, it only reproduces asexually. So that, that is done through these offset centurions here in the bottom right-hand corner. And those uh, offset centurions, these offsets here are, are like the runners of a, a spider, household spider plant. So one, um, one water soldier plant can have multiple uh, um, <clears throat> offsets on, on, on the, uh, buried in the rosette there, as you can see in the picture on the right here, that's an offset. And those offsets will fall off, grow into a mother plant and produce its own uh, other offsets. So the distribution of water soldier, um, a lot of these plants, or a lot of these points down here in uh, Southwestern Ontario uh, are private ponds. Um, the Avian Species Awareness Program uh, spearheaded uh, a program where we were eradicating water soldier for private ponds because it was such a a predominant plant in the water garden industry. Um, a lot of people put it in their ponds and it became a problem and uh, really didn't know what to do with it. So we really kind of spearheaded that and it was pretty successful at a 70% uh, eradication rate from the, the ponds and hoping to increase that after uh, we treated a couple ponds this year. Uh, and in the spring, we'll go uh, test the efficacy of, of our treatment this year. Uh, more importantly, um, there's three populations um, that are in our wild water or in our natural waterways. So there was the Trent Severn Waterway, which is the first introduction in 2008. Um, we've been, there's a water soldier working group that uh, is actually managing a uh, water soldier uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, then the second discovery was in the Black River, which is a tributary off of Lake Simcoe. Um, we uh, were dis first discovered in 2015. Uh, we had early, de early detection rapid response efforts. Uh, we treated with herbicide in 2015, treated with herbicide in 2016, and we haven't physically found any plants since that point. In the most recent uh, wild uh, uh, population in a natural wildway, uh, natural waterway, sorry, is uh, Red Horse Lake, which is north of Gananoque, which was discovered in 2020. It was reported to our invasive species hotline from a concerned citizen who didn't recognize the plant. And so from there, 
we again uh, rapidly responded, uh, had a couple of herbicide treatments in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And now in 2023, we will go back and uh, see, see the results of our efforts. And uh, every year, the water soldier has uh, declined in its size of population. So we, we're hopeful that uh, moving forward, we, we will have uh, an eradication on Red Horse Lake as well. So both these species are on the Invasive Species Act. Um, there are two of the five aquatic plant species that are prohibited under the Invasive Species Act. Uh, so these species are legal to import, possess, deposit, release, breed, grow, buy, sell, lease, trade in Ontario. And the Prevention and Response Plan, it includes provisions to authorize certain activities otherwise prohibited by the Act. So it's this, this, do, this uh, document is complementary to the Invasive Species Act, so it can um, authorize certain activities that are otherwise prohibited under the Act. Uh, so you can monitor, limit the spread, manage, control, and eradicate these plants. And it identifies the persons and groups of per, uh, uh, that are authorized to uh, perform these acts under the prevention and response plan. So I know this is uh, um, not really conducive to you copying this down, but this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded. So, and if you type in water soldier prevention response plan or European water chestnut prevention response plan, you'll be able to uh, download the document. And if you choose to move forward with managing one of these species, there are some rules you have to follow in terms of contacting the Minister of Natural Resource and Forestry, but you'll be able to move forward with some of these uh, activities that are otherwise prohibited uh, under the Invasive Species Act. And the last species we're looking at is starry stonewort. So starry storm is an invasive macroalgae that forms dense mats and waters uh, up two to 15 meters in depth. Uh, it's white bulbous that are seed-like structures are deposited in the mud, allowing the species to be easily spread and survive in Ontario's cold waters. In North America, only male individuals of starry stormwort have been recorded. They have no roots, making them easily, easily spread to new areas. And the species is spread primarily by uh, boating, but it's suspected that the species uh, like waterfowl can transport fragments or other unconnected water bodies to other unconnected water bodies as well. So starry storm re, uh, reduces biodiversity by forming dense mats. Sometimes they're referred to as pillows because they're they're so, so large and they look like you can just jump in it and uh, sink into it like a big pillow. And it competes aggressively with our native plants. These dense mat mats of starry stork can impede uh, movement of fish, uh, fish spawning activity, uh, water flow, and recreational activities such as swimming, boating, and fishing. So starry stork is a bushy, bright green macroalgae, and it produces a char characteristic star-shaped bubble like you can see in this bottom left-hand corner picture. Um, the leaves and stem are thin and bright green and can be variable in length and are arranged in whorls uh, around the stem. Branchlets typ typically extend in uh, acute angles away from the stem's nodes and tips of the branchlets may have irregular length uh, forks or divisions. So that white star shaped bulbous um, is about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and it may be visible near the tips of some of these branchlets uh, in, certain, in certain times of the year. So as you see, star storm is uh, pretty pretty uh, well distributed across uh, called the central Ontario here. Um, it, it's typically native to north northern Eurasia, and it was introduced into North America through the St. Lawrence River in, in about the mid 70s. And it was first identified in Ontario in 2009 in Presque, Presqu'ile Bay, as well as Lake Simcoe. Uh, ballast water is the suspected method of entry. And uh, it, it from there spread through the Great Lakes Basin. So that is all I have. Brooke? Hello. Well, thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. No, no worries. All right, and just to close off, guys, I know we are running a few minutes late, but I would uh, appreciate if folks held on for some Q&A. And if you have questions, as I said, please pop them into the Q&A box. Uh, I see that there have been a handful coming in already. And I apologize, I haven't been able to kind of answer throughout the, the presentations. I just didn't want to take control away from the guys. 
Um, so important thing is, you know how I refer to the um, the report that came in via Lake Gibson back in 2016. Well, this is actually uh, an image of what early detection looks like in action. So somebody, you know, caught a, a fairly large grass carp, as you can see, probably caught one of the ones that you see in the photo. And then he, you know, didn't know what the fish was. He returned it to the water. And then one of his buddies said, hey, I think that was a grass carp. You should report that. So that gentleman in 2016 called the invading species hotline and he, you know, dialed 1-800-563-7711 and got, got in touch with us. And then we were able to, again, get that information to DFO and MNRF so that they could get it on the water to remove those those fish so that's what it looks like it's not always ideal and we can't always make it happen as easily as that but it's really important that Ontario's public is aware of the risks associated with aquatic and terrestrial invasive species and when they see something that's high risk whether it's water soldier or a crayfish that they don't necessarily recognize or a potential Asian carp or invasive carp that they should call or report one of these various methods so you can call us you can email us you can create an EdMaps profile or you can even join our iNaturalist project so with that I'll, you know, get in touch with us. There, we have a, a variety of resources that you can download, that you can, you know, share, that you can get from us, that we can mail to you. And with that, I'm going to hop into the Q and A, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. There's my email. There's Rob's email, uh, and I can also share Premix after the fact. I'm going to stop sharing, and Premix, if you want, I'll get you to turn on your camera. Uh, can the public? Okay, so I'm going to go through these questions here real quick. Can the public, uh, general public, participate in the wild pig program? Um, so yes. Now that being said, uh, I have been fairly selective geographically around where I want uh, volunteers to be located. So I work in tandem with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry to fill gaps, surveillance gaps, and those surveillance gaps this year were identified as Northern Ontario, so everywhere from Thunder Bay West. So right now we are fairly full up, but that being said, you can get in touch with me, you can shoot me an email. Um, again, if you didn't get it, it's brook underscore schreier at OFH.org and just, you know, send me an email with your, your interest and that way I can, you know, um, get back in touch with you and let you know if you can participate. I'm a certified horticulturalist, and I'd like to know how to educate the naturalist gardener on jumping worms. Oh, jumping worms. So jumping worms, I don't know if everybody knows, is kind of a new species that gets its name from how it reacts when it's picked up by a human. Um, it doesn't really jump per se. It just wiggles quite aggressively. And there are some folks who are working on jumping worms, and there are some resources that exist out there already. Um, so, you know, Carol, what I would recommend you do is, again, get in touch with me, shoot me an email, and I can put you in contact with the various uh, individuals who I know who are working on jumping worms. And that being said, one of the, 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 the nice things is that I have added it to EdMaps, so you can report it on edmaps.org. So if, you know, you go to your group and you tell them, hey, if you see a worm that's acting strangely, and then, you know, take a photo, take a video, and report it to, to us at the Abating Species Awareness Program or to EdMaps. So I appreciate that question, Carol. Uh, so then Daniel asked, which water bodies were the grass carp found in? So I guess this is another question for me. Sorry, guys. I'm sure that I'll pass them along to you shortly. Um, so grass carp have been found kind of in a variety of locations in Ontario. So they were found in the St. Lawrence River. Um, we know that because the province of Quebec has, has had positive eDNA hits for grass carp in the St. Lawrence River. We've also found them in Prince Edward County. We found them in Toronto Islands. They've been found just off the Welland Canal, as I said. Um, they've been found, so in Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, they've been found on the west side of Point Pelee, and they've also been found actually in Lake Huron. So they have been found in a variety of locations. They've all been adults, and you know those fish have either been you know seen by somebody and then captured by DFO or washed up on shore. Uh, so it's been a kind of a variety of ways with which we have found those fish. So thank you for um, that question, Daniel. So this question is for you, Premic. Hello, Premic. Yeah. Are these invasive crayfish suitable for human consumption, assuming the water is clean enough? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. I mean, I've, I've eaten a few rusties in my time and um, the White River crayfish are, qu are quite big and they're very similar to the, to the uh, uh, Louisiana reds, which are, which are uh, normally sold for food. So yeah, as long as the water that you're getting them is clean, but I, I have to point out that you're not allowed to transport them live or dead. So this is a problem. Basically what you have to do in order not to break the law is to cook them on shore. 
like you, you and even then it's uh, it's probably touch and go right uh, I, I think brooke can probably say something about that but you, you should not you can eat them but you know you should not transport them but i mean uh, you know if you boil them on shore i think it would probably be okay or or you know if you catch them off your cottage dock or something then you're not transporting them and if you cook them right there then they should be fine on a propane cooker or something yep I don't know. as you said i'm not a law expert but yes you can eat them no as long know. as they're big enough yes yeah, you nailed it. And the interesting thing is that though there's a possession limit of 36 when you're using them for angling, there's actually no possession limit when you're eating them. So if you're catching more than 36 on the shoreline for the you know intention of, of boiling them and consuming them right there, again, there's no there's no possession limit. So that is that is something that you can do. Okay, Janet asked, where did uh, Faxonius limosis, I hope I said that right, Premick, um, mm -hmm. originate to spread to Europe and then now here? Uh, so it, it's a it's a North American crayfish. It's uh, I think it's uh, 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 native to to New York. I think so. So the like what, there's a debate about limosis whether it's native to 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 Canada or not because you know some people think that it, it spread naturally right into the St. John River and then from the St. John it's it spread into Quebec uh, into the St. Lawrence and so on it basically moved moved uh, uh, west uh, but uh, it was moved. I think it was a uh, some. Uh, it was a German uh, uh, some person. I don't know whether he was a you know a businessman or something. He basically brought them from from uh, North America back to Europe for for uh, consumption because Europeans like to eat crayfish. They they were you know big crayfish eaters, and they just he probably just thought, oh, it's going to be you know we'll have a different kind of crayfish, and. Um, uh, unfortunately, they have this, uh, this, uh, the, our crayfish uh, carry this crayfish plague. So it's a fungal, fungal disease. And that fungal disease uh, spread to the European crayfish and, uh, and basically decimated them. And, and then they brought over the West Coast crayfish and other crayfish. They've got the Louisiana Reds. They've got everything in Europe now. <laughs> For like, uh, you know, they're very, very the, the, the European crayfish are just all basically on an endangered species list. But they've so they've they were transported probably on a on a on a sailing ship initially and uh, and uh, or a steamer and then uh, uh, they moved uh, moved west in in Canada the you know and uh, so so they're just naturally moving. I don't think they were actually introduced so much by by people. They may have been initially introduced, but but they seem to spread. And I, I my uh, a personal opinion is that they were introduced. That it's not a natural spread because they all of a sudden showed up in the Saint John River and then they started spreading magically. So I think why wouldn't they have spread like a hundred years ago already? So I don't know. But some people think it came through a canal and stuff from Lake Champlain or somewhere. So who knows. Awesome. Thanks, Premick. Um, so, Rob, there's a question here for you. Um, it is a bit general, but I'm sure you can kind of touch on some of the, the points here. How do you actively manage an invasive plant? And I'm assuming in this case, we'll, we'll say an aquatic invasive plant. No, there, there's a few ways. Um, there's methods that are outlined in um, the Water Soldier in Integrated Management Plan, for example, where um, there's a, a mechanical harvesting, which is a uh, a large machine that comes in and actually scoops up the, the plants from the water column and puts them onto a hopper, then goes to shore and um, offloads them. Uh, there's hand pulling, um, there's herbicide use, uh, and there is um, diver assisted suction harvesting. Um, it all depends on the plant you're dealing with, the size of the population, their size infestation. Um, there's a lot of variables. So if you have a, a, a specific question about a specific plant, I'd be able to be able to kind of um, not be so general. I could probably be a little more specific if you want to reach out and contact me and we can have a conversation. Yeah, and again, his email is Rob uh, Robert, I should say, Robert mm -hmm. underscore McGowan at OFAH.org. 
So uh, the next question is from Janet. Um, Janet asks, do you have a network monitoring iNaturalist to pick up invasive species sightings? So I'll take that one. Um, so yes and no. So it's it's a that one's a little bit convoluted only because iNaturalist is fundamentally different <coughs> than uh, a program like EdMaps. So EdMaps is very much, you know, users, you know, see an invasive species, capture a photo, mark the location, and report that kind of information into the system in almost like a uh, like a one-way data transfer from that user to us. Then we look at the queue, we see the, the report, and we release it or we don't release it depending on the photos and whether or not it's the actual species. Whereas iNaturalist, you know, if you're familiar with iNaturalist, is a kind of a, a group of users. You know, any, any person on there can actually identify the species that are being posted. So and not to mention the user base for iNaturalist is, is huge, right? Like you're, you're talking about, you know, in our project, which we have set up since 2018, over 150,000 invasive species reports that have been added to that da uh, database. So for us to meaningly go through and make sure every single one is indeed what it's being reported as would almost be impossible given our capacity. So what we have done, however, is I've worked with the University of Georgia who delivers EdMaps and we do bulk data transfers. So UGA will, University of Georgia, will pull all that data uh, on invasive species from my naturalist, plug it into a triage system in EdMaps, and then it's our job to go through, identify the exceptionally high priority species, and then look at those individually. Whereas, you know, like if, if we get 2,000 reports from my naturalist that are garlic mustard, and they're coming into Ontario. Well, we know we already have a very well established population of garlic mustard throughout, you know, huge swaths of the of the province. So in that case, we don't review those individually. We, again, we just couldn't. So we release those into the into the pro, uh, into EdMaps as um, you know a certain level of uh, verified that isn't verified. It's actually one below verified, which kind of unfortunately is escaping mm -hmm. me right now. But hopefully that answers your question. Um, you know, we don't go through every single report, but with iNaturalist, but we do try to capture the really high priority species as they come through in bulk data transfers. Um, okay, I have another, Linda and Terry, can you advise on fanwort in Cashabog Lake Down? So Linda and Terry, that's been a challenging one. We, I know that you guys have been in touch with us a variety of times, and I'm sure Rob can talk to this too. Uh, fanwort and almost any aquatic plant species, you know, is exceptionally challenging to eradicate and to manage. And I know that, you know, cash, uh, the, the fanwort that's been in Cashabog has been there, you know, much longer than I've been around, let's say, and has given, has had the chance to become very well established. So the management options for that, I think, are, are few at this time. It's almost like Eurasian water milfoil in many water bodies. I've had, you know, we've had conversations just over the last two days with a number of people who have been concerned about Eurasian water milfoil because having many of the same impacts as fanwort, dense populations, choking out native species, you know, dense floating mats, affecting recreation. And unfortunately, the ultimate answer is, you know, you have to prevent it from getting there in the first place. And I know that's easier said than done, especially considering the majority of these aquatic invasive species were actually introduced before we were even born. Uh, you know, a lot of us were even born. So, you know, it, it's certainly a challenge uh, and it's not one that's easily over, overcome. But, you know, in terms of users and, and individual shoreline owners, you know, there are regulations out there. There are, uh, you know, steps out there that the government provides on their webpage to allow shoreline owners to clean up their shorelines to an extent. There are some rules that you have to abide by in terms of not, you know, affecting native species. In a lot of circumstances, when you have a nasty aquatic invasive plant on your shoreline, there aren't very many native species. So, you know, typically you're only dealing with the one, whether it's fanwort or Eurasian water milfoil. But, you know, that is one that we're going to continue to try to have conversations about the fan work. Um, I know that, you know, I've approached MNRF a few times on that conversation. And again, it's just, it's a really tough one. And it's, it's different than something like Water Soldier, which was found in a small location really early on. And, you know, in terms of early detection, that was one that, you know, back in the day, 2008, when it was first discovered in the trans Severn Waterway, was determined that it had to be acted upon immediately. So I know it's not an easy answer and it's probably not the answer you're looking for, but again, if you want to continue that conversation, please continue to get in touch with us and we will continue to have that conversation. Okay, Allison Neal, how can we help? Can we volunteer? I'm an avid hiker in the Belleville area, but travel a good chunk of Ontario hiking and exploring. Um, I, well, sorry guys, again, I'll kind of spearhead this one. Um, how can you help? Well, I think there's like, there's different levels with which people can help in the province. 
I think the most basic thing that everybody can do and the thing that we continuously try to promote is education in terms of identification and what to do when you find something that you perceive should not be there, right? So I kind of uh, kind of talked about that earlier on in the presentation. If you see a fish that you know, you've never seen before and you suspect maybe it's an Asian carp or you see a, a crayfish that you know, looks very unfamiliar to you, my number one thing is take a photo, note your location and then report it to us so that we can help you identify what that species is. Because depending on the species, there may be some management action that we can take. Now, so in terms of what you can do, that's like the main things is learning to identify species. And you know, when you don't know what something is, still taking the time just to be proactive in snapping a photo and making sure you get that reported to the powers that be. Beyond that, well, I mean, you can get a job in the environmental sector and uh, you know, well, start combating these invasive species, uh, you know, mano a mano. Well, I think you can uh, just kind of add to that brook where we can be uh, thoughtful on preventing the spread ourselves so cleaning our equipment before we move from one location to another um, is very important if it doesn't arrive it can't survive right so Absolutely. being uh keeping that in mind you know the clean jerry jai message um the the cleaning your boots after you go for a hike um not transporting seeds uh, your ATVs and snowmobiles, making sure that, you know, you didn't go through a big stand of Phragmites and now you're traveling, you know, 100 km kilometers across the landscape back to your house. Um, so preventing preventing that spread is important. Yeah, and thank you, Rob, because that was a, a major one that I overlooked. So I appreciate that. That being said, guys, we are at uh, quarter after eight and I want to be respectful of people's times. I, I, I know that I'm seeing that people are dropping off. So there are still a lot of outstanding questions, and I sincerely apologize that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, there's a lot of information here, and again, we're trying to pack all these different taxonomic groups and high-profile species into a short one-hour uh, webinar, where realistically, each one of these species could be a webinar unto themselves. So with that, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I want to thank you for taking time out of your evenings to, to join us and to learn about you know, invasive carps and invasive crayfishes, as well as some invasive aquatic plants and macroalgae. Get in touch with us, as I said before. You know, if you uh, you know have these questions, you know these questions that we're unable to answer tonight, and you want to you know have an answer, you can call the hotline at one 7711 or you can email either Robert uh, or I, or you can get in touch with a Premic Hammer. And what I'll do is after this presentation, which is going to be recorded, I'll follow up with everybody that's in attendance and provide them with our contact information so you guys can ask those types of questions. So again, I want to thank everybody for attending, and I want to say a sincere thank you to Rob and Premick for presenting on the, the various AIS that they've been dealing with. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Premick. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It was great. I, I really enjoyed. And uh, just remember, don't move any crayfish. <laughs> don't move crayfish, report invasive carps, and do your best not to spread aquatic plants. Thanks, everybody, and have a good night. Good night.